It's all about conversations. Arrow.net. A-R-R-O-E.net. We are unplugged and totally uncut with Dr. Aaron Kimmerell. Good morning. Thank you uh, for, for your interest in Doctor, that's a voice of compassion. That's a voice of someone who really, you know, you got to speak with truth when you use that voice. That's right. Thank you. I, whew, what, what a heavy subject that you've got in this book. We carry the, their bones. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a truth that needs to come forward. And, and, and you when you walk into a town, people know you're there. And there's not there's a lot of people that did not want you to be in that town, did they? That's correct. There was a lot of pushback. It was a, it was definitely a challenge for a couple of years. It's because you bring science with you. And with science, that means forensic. That means that you, you're going to be able to go in there and you're going to be able to do something that, that, that a, a normal person could never think of doing. Yeah, it, it, it challenged their beliefs. And, uh, and that's, you know, I think that's inherently where the, the conflict lies. They had a certain narrative and story and version of events, and they just didn't want it challenged. Is is that because that's just the way, you know, look, look, if the law says this is the way that it happened, then we have to agree with it. I mean, it's something something drew you into this story. What really drew me in, I think, and, and uh, you know, made it, uh, not personal, but all, almost personal, you know, in a sense that I really um, felt very convicted about it is was the families, the families of the boys who had been missing, you know, they they would search for their brothers and uncles really their entire lives. And, you know, they, like everyone else, I believe had right to the right to access the justice system. And it was, those doors were being shut to them, not because of, you know, our ability or the capacity that we have to do the work, but just because it was easier than saying yes. And so, um, you know, that's where I think, you know, scientists and, and academics can have a role in, in helping people. The book we're talking about is We Carry Their Bones, The Search for Justice at the Dozier School for Boys. The parents innocently were trying to send their, their children to a school so they could reform the, the mind, body, and soul. Man, they, they, they were met with a tragedy on the other side. Yeah, the, well, the boys that were sent there all were convicted. So even if they, even if in the end they were, you know, five years old or orphans, um, they, everyone was sentenced by a judge. And the idea was um, to give them education and job skills so that they could return to society as productive citizens. At the time that it was set up, uh, well, reform schools were much more common, but also Florida didn't have prisons. So it was a way to get children out of the convict lease system. But but I mean even even today we have we have these uh, little areas where they they send young adults and stuff like that too. But, I mean but this is, can't still be happening even today, and this can't be the only school at the same time that 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 did this. It wasn't the only school it, um, at its, at the time in the forties and fifties. It became the largest, but you know was even more widespread and has a very very similar story backstory is are the Indian residential schools. And that's been in the news a lot lately. There's over 350 in the United States. Um, children were forcibly you know, taken from their families, um, acculturated, you know, not you know, punished for speaking their native language. Um, and undoubtedly, every one of those schools had deaths and, and burial grounds. And that's only just coming to light and really coming to the surface today. You know, there used to be an age when reform meant giving someone permission to go against the normal. This this is really against the normal, what happened inside your pages. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it, it was supposed to be one thing and it turned out to be something else. And I think that's where, you know, you see even even from the earliest days, they the school administrators had a PR campaign and and really lobbied and tried to uh, control the, the narrative to the media. Um, for, you know, for the early, some of the earliest is from 1914. And it, so it made me think, you know, when, when did people start doing press releases? And, you know, it was kind of an interesting uh, a question because they, they definitely uh, worked very hard at, at maintaining that narrative. Who set the standards at this school? I mean, it had to start somewhere. Well, the school was run by the state. It was overseen by the state, but the you know for most of its history in the early years and in, in the you know um, 
really our work focused from about 1900 to about 1960. Um, it was a group of, um, of individuals. And what's interesting is when they would offer reforms or make changes or change the name of the school, the people stayed the same. What, what would change is the superintendent himself, and that had a very high turnover rate. Uh, but certainly in the early years, it was the, you know, it was the families who set up the school, which were local business and business owners and also, um, you know, farmers. And they were the ones who had, you know, contracts in the convict lease system. And that's the ones who wanted the labor. And that's what they used the children for. We're talking 31 or more bodies, unmarked graves, school property. Did anybody on the outside begin to wonder and start questioning? Yeah, throughout its history, the school uh, was under constant state investigation um, almost annually. There were also um, state and congressional hearings um, for a period of time in the 1980s. Federal government took the school over. I think what shocks most people is that it closed only in 2011, and that was under um, pressure from you know an investigative journalist Ben Montgomery who who was doing you know, so much work and so many articles about um, not just its history, but its current state. And so finally, the state closed it. Speaking of investigative journalists and things like that, the way that you have laid out this book, We Carry Their Bones, reminds me so much of the way Geraldo Rivera got into that hospital up in the New York area and was able to unveil the truths about that. Do you feel like that your next step is going to be in journalism? Well, I think I'm uh, too much of an academic at heart um, and love the field work. So, I, you know, any chance I get to actually go out and just be in the field, do, you know, doing it is, is really my my passion. Um, but I, you know, I did enjoy ultimately writing this book. It took a long time. I had to kind of step away from it for a while. And um, and there's certainly um, some other work we've done with cold cases and um, unsolved homicides, particularly looking at female victims. And and so I, you know, I'd like to like I'd like to be able to write that in a way, you know, similar to this that will capture a broader audience because it's a problem that I don't think a lot of people, you know, think about or or realize the scope of. When when you're when you're inside the world of forensic anthropology, one of the things that that I've always loved about this is the fact that every human cell tells a story. Do you find yourself connecting those stories together? And and the, and the deeper you dig, the more things are are revealed. I think so. I think you know, and I think what um, you know, like if you look at just this story as an example of that, what interest such a, a broad audience and so many people is it just crosses all sort of lines it doesn't really matter you know who you are your background it just innately is this you know injustice involving children and I think we can all relate to that and so um, I do think that as you know as a as a scientist as well and and um, an educator I think that that's what we can do is use you know examples such as this to look at bigger lessons Inside your paragraphs, you bring up a name that uh, uh, for many people over the past couple of years, they've been introduced to it, the, these generations today. But we've, we, you bring up Jim Crow policies in this, and it's like all of a sudden, Generation Z and millennials are going, oh, my God, there's that name again. Right. Well, I think that that is, you know, well, let me put it this way. What, what struck me when I started to do the research and started, you know, reading all the old documents right the school would write reports and documents to the states and then they would lobby and the laws would change is you just can see that pattern so clearly where it's um you know you just almost like step by step where it's like okay we don't have enough children here because truthfully there's not that many kids convicted of crimes <laughs> in 1900 and so we need more children we because we can't bring in the crops and so they lobby for it and now there's suddenly there's longer sentences and things that aren't really crimes like incorrigibility and skipping school are suddenly crimes i mean you're picked up by the sheriff and prosecuted and a judge sentences you to a labor camp um and so you see these sort of um you know the laws change for this purpose and that's that's exactly what was happening um generally when it came to issues of race all the vagabond laws suddenly you know you're arrested for Live, you know, being in a city where you don't have a residence and so forth. And, and all of that really creates a labor pool through the convict lease system. So this is a mirror of that. It wasn't, 
you know, it, it was supposed to sort of bring children out of it, but when it's set up by people who are working in the convict lease system, of course, the result is, is pretty much the same. So, you, you know, throughout um, its history, I would just say, too, you just see one example after another before there's civil rights protection, you know, it's like, how does this happen? How does this happen? And, you, you know, children are taken into custody. There's no legal representation. Parents aren't notified. Um, there's no sort of uh, recourse. There's no way to appeal it. And all these protections that we kind of, you know, think are just inherent today were really hard fought and, and won um, through the civil rights movement. And that, you know, this is just such a good um, example of why that was so critical and, you know, and it's still critical today. Those that lost their lives, how, how was that reported to, to the record keepers? In, in, I mean, is it just an MIA? I mean, what, what happened here? In many cases, it was never reported, and that's where you see the discrepancy. So there was like a ledger that the school kept, and they would, you know, when a boy came in, his name was put in the book, and when he was discharged or paroled or ran away, children, I mean, they ran away. These boys ran away constantly. Um, they get caught, brought back, and so all of, all of that's in the ledger. And when someone died, it would say died. Um, now, did they record it for everybody? No, I mean, the, you know, the records are incomplete. There's a lot of inconsistencies. There's a lot of challenges with historic records, but that was really the best that we had. Even um, after 1917, when death certificates were required, many did not receive a death certificate, even into the 40s. And so, um, you know, it was never reported to the you know, the state body, the governor who was overseeing them, nor to vital statistics. You know, you talk about uh, there were those that, that were able to run away or reported run away. I mean, I, right away, I'm thinking th- this would be a breeding ground for human trafficking. People on the outside waiting for that next one to run away, promising that they c- I can show you a better life. And they end up going into a different direction. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and you know, and hundreds, probably thousands ran away. Um, many were returned because you have, you know, it's a very rural uh, place. Um, but many, you know, we don't know what happened to them. Um, we, you know, it was, it was beyond the scope of what we could do to, you know, try to do the genealogy and track down everybody. So, you know, and that's, that's led a lot of the White House boys and others to think that even more died. Um, which is possible. It's just there's no, you know, no evidence for it either way. And so um, we had to really focus on on those that we had some sort of record for, even if we didn't have their name. The book we're talking about is We Carry Their Bones, and, and that the, the, the title is literal. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, because you're re- reuniting these children with their families. How are families receiving this news? Is it something that, you know, that they feel like that I, we knew this was happening, it did happen, now we can finally find peace? I think that, um, yeah, the families were very involved. I mean, they were the, the heart of the sort of effort and movement to do the excavation. That's what they wanted, you know, and that's what I always point out is, you know, of course, the, those who opposed it thought, you know, this was something that we wanted. It's not. It's what the families wanted. And so they, they worked really hard. They met with legislators. They did press interviews. They, you know, and many of them were, in, you know, they're in their 70s and 80s and had never been public before, but, you know, did whatever they that would help um, get support publicly and legislatively to get this um, approved, and so, and so they were very, you know, invested in it, and um, I think grateful is the word I would use. Um, it's it was still sad, you know, the sorrow and the tragedy is still there for them. It's not like you're, you know, if you're ever okay with it. I don't, you know, I don't know that. Um, I think, you know, but I think in terms of like finding peace and feeling like there was some measure of justice, at least the acknowledgement was was a huge uh, relief for them. And of course, they learned more about the school and in some cases about what happened to their you know specific brothers than what they had ever been told because they never were properly notified. Mm-hmm. I mean, no one ever explained the situation, even in cases where, you know, boys went on um there was one boy in particular, Earl Wilson, who was um, killed. Other boys were charged and convicted of his death, 
that's oh debated. Um, but even the family never knew the details of that. It's not, it, they weren't at the trial. They didn't, you know, they never really had a full understanding of what happened. And of course, questions, the, anything the school did say, they didn't really trust the official accounting. So in some cases, we were able to find more information. Um, and I think that filled in some gaps. Is this going to be a six part to a 12 part series on Netflix? Because it's, it's got the strength to make it happen. I don't know. I think we did a documentary a couple of years ago. Um, Lifetime uh, Movie Network did a documentary. I think they did a really nice job and it follows the family's um, stories uh, in particular. And so um, so I don't know. But I I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, relevancy, like I said, to this, to the Indian residential schools. So hopefully that will be, um, you know, hopefully they'll find some of the same well, uh, information and access to justice that these families did. Truth cannot be forgotten, and because of this book, we carry their bones. You you are bringing forward the truth, and it, it's just one of those things that's going to change the future, and people need to know. And and once again, through you, we are learning a lot about our history. Thank you. Thank you. Please come back to the show anytime in the future, Doctor. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Nice to meet you. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Mm-hmm, thanks.